Good evening in Spain. Good afternoon in the United States East Coast. Uh, my name is Marta Rey. I am associate professor at the School of Economics and Business of the University of A Coruña in Galicia, Spain. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Good Globalization, a virtual event where we will review the work of Professor Danny Roderick, the 2020 Prisons of Asturias Award for Social Sciences. As you may probably know, the Good Globalization is organized by the Princess of Asturias Foundation as part of the Awards Week cultural program. The program aims at bringing the work of the laureates closer to the general public through engaging dialogues that revolve around the work. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are not holding this event in person as would have been our liking. However, on the positive side, we will be reaching a global audience via streaming and also over time through the recording that will be, become available at the Foundation's website um, after this, um, this event. Uh, we are honored to have uh, economist Mauro Guillén, Professor of International Management at the Wharton School and a trustee of the Princess of Asturias Foundation, guiding the dialogue with Danny Roderick. Thanks so much, Mauro, for being available to conduct the conversation with Professor Roderick. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce economist Danny Roderick. He is considered one of the world's leading thinkers in political economy with pivotal contributions in the field of economic growth and development. Born in Istanbul, Turkey, in a family with Sephardic roots, he earned his PhD in economics at, the, at Princeton University. He currently holds the Ford Foundation Chair in International Political Economy at Harvard Kennedy School. In his book, The Globalization Paradox, he formulated the trilemma theory. He, it posits that it is not possible for a country to combine the integration, the full integration into the global economy, democracy and national sovereignty at the same time, but rather the country must trade off at least one of the three dimensions. The trilemma has become one of the most popular ideas in the debate on current international economics. Danny Roderick has held leading positions in the academic realm and his outstanding research trajectory has deserved numerous awards and prizes, including the Hirschman Prize of the Social Science Research Council. He's currently president-elect of the International Economic Association. I would like to uh, highlight in particular that uh, Danny Roderick is a paradigm of meaningful engagement with the world of policy on the part of academic economists. He's co-founder and co-director of Economics for Inclusive Prosperity, a network of academics committed to achieving a fair economic system and a more equitable society. I recommend you hardly that you visit the website of Economics for Inclusive Prosperity. His current work focuses precisely on this challenge, how to create a prosperity that is inclusive of the interests of all people, including non-monetary sources of well-being from health to the environment or political rights. Thanks in advance, Danny, for making this event possible. My sincere congratulations for the Princess of Asturias Award for Social Sciences. This is a very dear award for all Spaniards who share the scientific, cultural, and humanistic values that laureates like you represent and that are cherished by the foundation. Uh, just a quick reminder for the audience that you can post questions to uh, Professor Roderick in the YouTube chat at any time during this uh, conversation. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to Mauro, who will be posing the first round of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ray and uh, Professor Roderick. My heartfelt uh, congratulations on this award. One more I know in your long and distinguished uh, academic career. I believe, uh, Danny, if I may, that I speak for most, uh, if not all, of the people who are listening right now in saying that uh, we have all been illuminated and we have learned so much from your writings about all sorts of topics having to do with the global economy. And so it is a, an honor for us to uh, be able to host you today 
and of course, to ask you a few questions, uh, if, uh, if we may, um, to have a conversation precisely about uh, globalization, one of the most important topics up for debate, I think, these days. And um, we could begin in many different kinds of ways, uh, but let me just uh, make the first question very, very current, okay? So we are in the middle of a pandemic, which of course also triggered a, uh, an economic crisis, uh, a recession uh, in many parts of the world. And uh, the big question I think in people's minds is, okay, so Professor Roderick has written about uh, the role of the state in the economy, what the government can do uh, to generate better standards of living for the population. So I guess uh, a natural question, first question that I could ask you is um, how do you think, what kinds of uh, attributes of government we've seen that seem to be associated with a better response to this pandemic? Um, feel free, of course, to um, talk only about the economic consequences of the pandemic, but I guess uh, the public health aspects of it are also uh, really, really important. So in other words, um, what kinds of governments have done better uh, in terms of responding to this crisis that is engulfing the world over the last uh, eight months? <laughs> thank you, uh, Mauro. Thank you very much, uh, Martha. Um, thank you, the Princess of Asturias Foundation for, for this great honor. I wish we could do this uh, in, in person. Uh, but um, uh, we're, we're unable to. I, I think the question you're asking, Mauro, is, is a very deep question. And I think we will, uh, we will, we don't know yet what the full answer is. And I think you know, there'll be many, many years, if not decades of social science research that will be um, looking at this question of what type of governments were better uh, at handling um, uh, the, the shock. Um, for one thing, we don't know the full uh, playing out uh, of the crisis, and we're still in the middle, um, so things might change. Uh, but if I can take a, a bit of a, a lead um, from uh, one of my uh, uh, papers, research papers a while back, where I asked um, a, a sort of a related question, looking at the uh, shocks and crises of the 1980s. Uh, where a lot of countries were responding to the oil shock and different countries, some went into deep uh, turmoil, uh, others were very quick at turning around. And I asked the question, what determines the ability of different types of, of uh, countries to turn around from external shocks? In that case, it was a, a financial shock. It was a, an economic shock, but it's, it's not perhaps uh, completely unrelated. And, and two things uh, that stood out in that research was one, you know, was, you know, some, you know, certainly uh, how divided societies were um, to begin with. That is the nature of, uh, you know, sort of countries with very deep uh, inequalities, with very deep social cleavages, um, with a lot of different, um, uh, you know, ethnic or linguistic groups that didn't necessarily trust each other. So divided societies. Uh, for one, were in general uh, much uh, um, uh, worse place in terms of responding to crises because they were um, unable to generate as quickly the needed uh, policy response. Um, the other thing, um, perhaps a little bit surprising, was that actually more democratic, more transparent, more participatory political regimes were better at handling the crisis than more authoritarian ones. So actually, authoritarianism didn't help. Uh, more, you know, sort of more uh, democratic governments um, uh, did better. Now, how do those apply to the present uh, crisis? I think if I, when I look around, I think you know, certain key features stand out. I think one very important thing is how quickly governments responded uh, to the um, knowledge um, that um, uh, this was a, a pandemic uh, um, that was coming, that was going to cross the border. I think a lot of the success of um, countries in East Asia um, South Korea, Taiwan, um, you know, um, in other part of Asia, I mean, um, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, those are countries where the governments realized very early on uh, that this was going to be very serious. So they responded very, very quickly. Compare that to um, the United States where, um, you know, stands as a bad example in a, in a lot of different ways where, you know, there was a lot of denial that was going on at the, you know, on the part of the um, 
the top of the um, uh, the political system. So one thing is, is clearly just very rapid response. Um, the second was, uh, you know, to what extent uh, governments listened to um, the scientific establishment, to what public health experts were saying. Um, again, uh, you know, where the uh, scientific public health establishment was taken seriously, where they were listened to, I think was, you know, you, get a, you, you got a better response. Um, third, I would say sort of the overall ability of different governments to mobilize resources. It's not just fiscal and financial in terms of compensating uh, those who were about to lose their jobs and so forth, but simply in terms of mobilizing uh, society around um, you know, wearing masks, uh, around, uh, you know, rapid ramping up of testing and tracing, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, building a public health system that was going to be able to, um, to, to manage um, uh, uh, the consequences. And fourth, and in many ways related to the ability to mobilize the resources was really the matter of, of you know, trust. Because a lot of these things about being able to respond, it's not simply government just pulling a few levers here and there, um, and saying that you know we're going to have a curfew, or we're going to have a lockdown, lockdown, or we're going to you know test and trace. It's also um, do the people, the ordinary people, actually believe the messages, the announcements that were coming from the government? Did they act accordingly? Were lockdowns effective? Were because people believed the severity of the problem? Uh, did they act, you know report um, uh, and 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 uh, did they participate? Did they they cooperate with the tracing and so forth. So so that element of trust that the government, the sort the trust capital that the government had accumulated, also played out a role. I think in many ways we could have sort of predicted that you know many countries that were were much better positioned um, with uh, these kinds of resources um, had the trust had a good public health system and so forth, that they would have been better off. Um, and, and to the first degree of approximation, that's really how it worked out. Thank you so much, um, uh, Danny, for helping us understand how governments have been responding to this pandemic. Now, more specifically, something that comes um, much, much closer than a pandemic to your research in the past, which is industrial policy. So before the pandemic, uh, we were seeing, I think, a resurgence in terms of the use of industrial policy by some of the most important economies in the world. And the pandemic perhaps has accelerated that trend. Uh, so do you think uh, moving forward, this is a good thing uh, that industrial policy is yet again on the agenda? I think it's a good thing that we're talking about it because in the, the, the fact of the matter is industrial policy never disappeared, it never went away. Um, I, I think you know we stopped talking about it, but if you look at even the United States at the height of uh, you know, uh, you know, the last 30 years of uh, what has come to be called market fundamentalism or neoliberalism, uh, you know, that, that, you know, the U.S. was, you know, always engaged in industrial policy, whether you look at sort of its, what it was doing um, yeah, through its Department of Energy loan program, loan guarantee programs, or what it was doing through its, um, um, uh, you know, uh, DARPA, the you know, Defense Advanced Research Projects um, Administration, um, that, that, you know, and the same is true of, of Europe as well. I think the fact is that there's no economy that doesn't, no government that doesn't practice industrial policy. And I think when we don't talk about it, then I think that's in some sense, that's the worst kind of industrial policy because, you know, we, we don't discuss it and we don't uh, try to push it in the right kind of a direction. So first I would say that the fact that we're talking about it is a good thing. Uh, but I think, um, and I think the, 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 the reason that uh, industrial policy is still um, uh, needed uh, is because, you know, that, that there, there are many respects in which um, the, uh, you know, the, we need our economies to be restructured. Uh, first of all, of course, there's the climate change uh, challenge that we need to restructure our economy to green to the economy, to decarbonize the economy. And that's not going to happen simply through a carbon tax. It's going to happen through a lot of you know, investment in innovation and new green technologies and, and, and the public sector will have to play a very important role in, in directing new technological effort in that direction. Um, second, um, I think um, we are living through a period where because of technological change and globalization, uh, essentially labor markets are becoming increasingly polarized with a scarcity of uh, good middle-class jobs in the middle of the 
labor markets in the middle of the employment distribution. Um, and uh, we can't deal with this disappearance of good jobs simply through traditional welfare state policies of you know, investment in education or more tax and transfer policies. I think we need to uh, um, have governments that are going to be proactively engaging with the private sector, with, with firms, um, to both enhance their productive possibilities, productive potential, as well as uh, to get them to increase the supply of good jobs. This is particularly important in lagging parts of countries, regions uh, that are really outside the major metropolitan centers that are not necessarily so plugged in into global networks and global supply chains, but which uh, really drives a lot of the backlash uh, against um, uh, globalization, against many of our uh, current uh, policies and the backlash against of liberal democracy. So I think creating good jobs and, and, and widening the circle of winners uh, in labor markets is going to be very important. And that's going to require a certain types of industrial policy it's very different from the old type of you know, top-down industrial policies where government simply decides which sectors are going to be the winners and, and subsidizes those sectors. I think that type of industrial policy is gone. I think the new type of industrial policy is first, not just manufacturing, because the fact is most jobs are going to uh, be created outside of manufacturing, its services and, and other areas. And secondly, it's got to be much more collaborative, much more bottom up with much more experimentation, much more room for uh, local uh, communities and, and local governments uh, doing the job and not just sort of federal top down or national top down programs. Yeah, so let's dig a little bit deeper, uh, Danny, into these potential, you know, negative and positive implications of uh, globalization. I mean, some of your most influential work. Uh, has been on whether globalization has gone too far or not, question mark at the end. That's the title of one of your books. And um, of course, uh, over the last uh, 12 years, we've gone through two very different kinds of crises. So 12 years ago, it was a crisis that originated in the financial sector. And that, of course, spread like wildfire around the world, following not only trade channel, but all channels, but also financial channels. And this time around, yes, we have a public health uh, shock that uh, causes a um, uh, deep economic recession. But of course, this comes in the wake of a trade war or multiple trade wars in the world, right? So could you comment on, based on our experience in the world over the last 12 years, which specifically, which aspects of economic globalization do you think have gone too far? In other words, wh what are exactly the excesses in this process of globalization that that you think are, are worth mentioning, mentioning at this point? I guess if I were to just um, uh, summarize uh, where I think um, the excess has been is that in many areas uh, of the global economy, uh, we let large corporations um, and large uh, financial institutions, banks, um, uh, essentially capture the agenda. Um, and so we got a lot of rules uh, that were very good for uh, international banks, for big tech, for pharmaceutical companies, for multinational enterprises, uh, but uh, um, either didn't do much or in fact uh, ended up uh, hurting um, you know, middle or lower middle classes uh, in, in a lot of countries, in particular in the advanced countries. So I think what concretely that means, I think we went too far in uh, pushing for the free flow of financial capital, short-term capital, um, uh, which I think um, was intimately uh, related to the uh, financial crisis um, of uh, 12 years ago, as you said, um, too much uh, capital sloshing around uh, for very little overall uh, social or long-term economic gain. Now, we used to say that, you know, when developing countries had, you know, these financial crises every 10 years, we would say, oh, the problem is not with uh, capital mobility or with financial globalization. The problem is with these developing countries that cannot you know, do the right thing. They have poor institutions. They have too much corruption. They can't regulate their financial sector appropriately. But of course, once the crisis hit the most sophisticated uh, um, uh, nations in the world, the, the richest countries in the world, and I think the sort of the, 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 the argument changed. And I think uh, even the International Monetary Fund um, uh, started to understand that 
um, that uh, the free flow of short-term capital, short-term finance, um, is is, is, a so, is a is a is a source of significant volatility and, and risk, and that that controlling short-term capital flows might be appropriate under certain circumstances. So I think financial globalization is a key area where we've gone uh, too far. I think in trade, um, I think many of the trade agreements that we've signed after uh, the World Trade Organization came into being, uh, many of the regional trade agreements went too far in terms of you know, imposing a kind of um, a, a, a model of regulation uh, um, that was an extension of um, uh, multinationals or, or financial institutions conception of what was going to be good policy, but imposing them on countries that uh, for which they were not suited, for example, intellectual property rights, patent rules, um, or, um, or, or, you know, deregulation of services and, and um, sort of making industrial policy much more difficult or constraining it in the context of, of middle income countries. So I think, you know, basically after the 1990s, what happened was that our conception of the relationship between the national economy and the global economy changed. Um, up until the 1990s, the prevailing conception was still that the global economy is a vehicle, is a means to the end of you know, greater prosperity, more employment, uh, more social stability in countries. So the world economy was a means to the end of national prosperity. Uh, after the 1990s, increasingly, the world economy became the end, uh, that national societies had to adjust to the requirements of the world economy. So they had to compete. And so that meant that domestic tax systems, domestic regulations, domestic monetary and fiscal policy had to be shaped uh, in, uh, you know, to uh, adjust to the requirements of the world economy. Um, and and that, that just didn't work out well politically because it created the kind of political backlash that we might talk about later. Um, but it also did not work out economically because many of the requirements that uh, whatever was monetary fiscal policy or requirements with respect to economic regulations or industrial policy simply did not fit uh, those countries very well. And the countries that did the best um, actually, and of course, you know, China is the one that comes to mind here, uh, are countries that uh, took advantage of the openness of the, of the global economy, but at the same time, carved out enough space for themselves to uh, diversify their economies, to pursue their industrial policies, to manage their capital flows and their currency in a way that actually the post-1990 system discouraged, uh, but they were really playing by pre-1990 rules. In other words, you know, China played the globalization game uh, by Bretton Woods rules, uh, given how much it was managing its own economy but essentially took advantage of the fact that everybody else after the 1990s, including the United States and Europe, were playing it by the hyper-globalization rules of after 1990. But, but, the, but the bottom line is that, that sort of, you, know, you needed a balance, and I think we sort of lost the balance by going uh, too much in the direction of uh, imposing a kind of a you know, one-size-fits-all, you know, let's um, uh, uh, you know, reduce all the barriers um, and the transactions costs that impede international commerce and investment, regardless of what that might do uh, to our domestic economic and social arrangements. And that uh, in many ways backfired, I think. Yeah, so let me, um, let's go back for a moment, uh, Danny, to the connection between the economy and politics that you alluded to a few minutes ago. Um, it's quite clear, I think, that we're witnessing a, a wave of uh, nationalism, uh, populism, and protectionism around the world. And uh, one of the most important uh, contributions that you've made uh, to the field is the trilemma uh, of uh, globalization, sovereignty, and, uh, and democracy. So let me propose a prediction that one might formulate based on your framework, which is that when we're seeing so much nationalism, populism, protectionism uh, in a globalized context in which uh, countries want to reassert their sovereignty, uh, that then it should be no surprise that we see so many strongmen, right? The so-called strongmen, authoritarian leaders that uh, legitimize themselves by winning elections, but um, you know those elections are normally rigged, right? Um, so is that a fair application of your framework? Is that an accurate representation of what's going on today? 
I think the 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 trilemma um, is I think partly explains the backlash, and I think that perhaps you know where the trilemma bites the most uh, is really in the context of Europe in the European Union, because if you think about the economic integration that has taken place and the integration of of uh, monetary policy um, and of of you know single market in the EU is is really the most advanced stage of uh, globalization one can imagine. It's regional, but in some sense, it's, it's, it's really hyper-globalization uh, uh, um, uh, uh, come, come to fruition. And I think the, the, the challenges of uh, Europe uh, very much highlight uh, the nature of the trilemma. And, um, and, and I, at, at one point many years ago, actually, I heard a uh, Eurozone finance minister tell me that, you know, you know the, 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 the way to explain what was happening in, in Europe today was that the populists, the right-wing populists were the only ones uh, who were actually acknowledging the validity of the trilemma because, you know, they were saying, look, you know, all these centrist politicians have been telling you that you could have it all all at once, you could have, you know, the benefits of full economic integration, single market, monetary unification. You can have, you know, that wouldn't damage your democracy. You would, your countries, you know, your sovereigns, you know, your your governments would still remain, uh, you know, accountable to you, um, and you know, your you know, much loved sovereignty would not be harmed at all. So you can have, uh, you know, your economic integration, your national sovereignty, and your democratic accountability. All three. Uh, by and large, the center uh, centrist politicians uh, kept up that um, that um, that fiction that it was possible to do that. Uh, never really owned up to the fact that you know every step along the way of European economic and monetary integration, uh, of course, some policy making powers were being transferred. Uh, to Brussels or to Frankfurt or to um, uh, to um, uh, uh, elect to to um, bureaucrats um, that were becoming um, more and more uh, sort of distant uh, from national electorates, um, and that that this was something happening. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think what the center centrist politicians missed is the opportunity to explain to their electorate that this was in fact a necessary outcome of this process of economic integration and as a, I think as a result lost a lot of credibility uh, when you know the populace came around and said look no it is the fact that you've lost uh, sovereignty over your, your your monetary policy you've lost sovereignty over your many areas of your regulation because it's now the acquis communautaire with hundreds of thousands of pages of regulation uh, that that um, um, and, and that was a very um, uh, compelling argument, even in Britain, uh, which in fact um, had already sort of carved out a lot of space for itself, it wasn't a member of the currency union uh, in many areas, you know, had its own carve outs. But even there, the populist politicians could make a compelling argument that, you know, really a lot of things are being determined here by the European Court of Justice or by the acquis communautaire uh, and not by you know, Westminster or your, or your, or your government. Um, and, and that's even more so, of course, for uh, countries that were members of the EU. Now, uh, so I think the, the, uh, the, the, the trilemma is useful to understand, um, you know, the, the kind of inevitability of the tensions that would arise and, and why not acknowledging these trade-offs uh, was going to come back to bite uh, centrist political movements. It doesn't necessarily explain why the political groups that took the most immediate advantage of the trilemma were in fact the right-wing nativists, the right-wing po populists. And I think actually that is because there's an alternative reaction. The alternative reaction in the context of Europe might be to say, look, you know, um, let's move back to the original conception of the European Union, which was always that this was not going to be just an economic union. This was also going to be a political union. And I think the trouble was that economic union went so far ahead compared to political union that you know the this this widening gap uh, you know you know put the trilemma into motion. But the founding fathers of the European of Europe always thought that these two had to move step by step. That economic union maybe would go a little bit further, but the point was to push political union uh, alongside it. 
And I think so, you know, one alternative is basically to say that the way you get out of the trilemma uh, is really to push for much greater fiscal and political union in, the, in, uh, in, in Europe. Now, in the current climate, it takes a lot of political courage uh, to say that we want uh, more Europe politically, that we want some kind of quasi fiscal and political federalism in Europe. Uh, but I think the really, the, if we want to keep democracy, the only alternative to it is, is certain, uh, you know, sort of less, uh, less economic integration. In other words, the, 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 the choice that Europe faces today, uh, uh, if it wants to maintain democracy, is either you have more uh, political integration or you have less economic integration. Um, and I think the sooner political leaders in Europe sort of take that on board, um, I think you know the sooner we can end up somewhere stable because I, I you know Europe is is the one part of the world which has so much potential uh, for the for for the rest of for for the world as a whole. When now we're moving into a into a a kind of an environment where China, of course, is becoming more authoritarian by the day. Um, you know, the United States, God knows what's going to happen, but clearly it's going through a very uh, bad political period. Um, I think, you know, Europe is always um, spoken for not just having a, 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 a you know, a, a vibrant economic model, but also a vibrant social and political model um, that, that, you know, Europe needs to be able to speak um, to that and, 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 and work uh, to its strengths. But that was good. that's going to require fundamentally for Europe to address the structural weaknesses of the European integration process. And I think that's going to require making that kind of a fundamental choice, whether Europe is really going to become uh, uh, united, and in which case um, you need to really push hard on political integration as well, or uh, willy-nilly, uh, it will become economically less integrated. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor Rodrik, for your uh, answers to my questions. I mean, we've covered uh, many topics uh, ranging from the pandemic to industrial policy uh, to the trilemma and to the issues uh, confronting uh, Europe moving forward, which, uh, of course, are uh, vexing uh, in, from, from so many points of view. And I completely agree with you that um, uh, the trilemma helps us, um, I think, uh, take a uh, uh, a step in the direction of understanding what the trade-offs are, uh, and that is both an economic and a political uh, issue. Um, so we're going to go now into questions from the audience, uh, but I would like to um, say first uh, that uh, we've only scratched the surface in this uh, brief conversation in terms of the knowledge and the insights uh, that the research of uh, Professor Roderick can provide uh, for some of the most uh, pressing issues in the world right now. So I would encourage everyone who's listening to um, get a hold of uh, Professor Roderick's writings in the form of uh, books and articles over the years, uh, because I truly believe that they offer all of us a window into what we may want to do uh, or what we should be doing, right, uh, in the years to come. Uh, so that, as the title of this session indicates, uh, we arrive at a, at a better globalization of sorts. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Roderick, for answering my questions. And now it's back to Marta for questions from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Roderick and Professor Guillem, for this engaging round of conversation. It has been really engaging because we have received a handful of interesting questions for Professor Roderick, both uh, through email and through the YouTube uh, chat, um, and also some thank you messages and congratulations for Professor Roderick. So um, the first question uh, refers to regional development policies in general, not only industrial ones, but kind of relates to Mauro's question about industrial policies. And it reads as follows, you support the idea that industrial and regional policies that currently focus on fiscal incentives and on providing subsidies to investments should be replaced by personalized services to facilitate job creation. In Spain and particularly in Asturias, this would entail an important change. Um, the question is, which should be the new roadmap for public administrations 
at a regional level to design the change in the model of regional economic development according to your proposal? Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. Um, yes, I, I, I do believe um, regional uh, development policies, in particular regional um, uh, employment creation policies are, are very important because one of the things that, that we've understood uh, with um, recent research is that um, uh, people are not nearly as mobile in response to economic incentives as we thought. Um, so economists would you know, used to think that you know, when, when because of deindustrialization or import competition or technological change, that you know, factories close, you know, old industrial centers um, uh, uh, weaken, um, that, you know, that when jobs disappear in, uh, in the local context, that you know, people simply will uproot themselves and go into larger um, cities or areas where jobs are, are, um, are, are plentiful. And American economists always looked at Europe as a kind of a, a weird place where something like this didn't happen, where people stayed uh, in those declining regions. Now, of course, the United States is has been finding out uh, that Europe was not alone in that respect, that many of the same things happen in, in, in the United States as well. Um, and that these declining regions um, uh, is not just an economic decline, uh, it turns out to be um, a social problem uh, with uh, you know, families breaking up. It turns out to be a health problem. Uh, with rates of suicide um, uh, um, and, and, and early death uh, increasing and uh, with uh, opiate, opiate um, uh, um, addiction rising, it ends up being a crime problem with crime rates increasing and so forth. So when good jobs disappear in local communities, um, the consequences are not just economic, it's also social and ultimately it's also political because there is some uh, recent research that um, finds, for example, that in these declining regions, uh, you know, people's political preferences change. They, they tend to become, they tend to develop more authoritarian values. They tend to look upon outsiders, people that might have a different religion or a different skin color or think differently uh, with much greater suspicion. Of course, that fuels um, the rise of, uh, you know, right-wing nativist populism and, and, and so forth. So it's very important to increase the job base, the employment base of these kinds of, of regions. Now, the, 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 the traditional way in which this has been approached both in the United States and in the European context is through, um, through essentially subsidies, uh, through tax incentives. And, um, and, and I think um, while on balance they work uh, in terms of increasing employment, that's the balance of evidence they're not very efficient. They're not very effective at doing so. Um, and so I think the kinds of um, suggestions that I've been making uh, in my recent writings, which actually built on existing research uh, in the United States and Europe about the type of programs that work, are much more uh, programs um, that are, instead of providing sort of, you know, ex ante incentives that are programs that are much more directly targeted at the uh, needs of different businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, and providing those needs uh, in return for implicit or explicit employment um, uh, targets. Um, and I think what's key here is a kind of a public administration or regional development authorities that are sort of very adaptable and that work collaboratively with local businesses and potential investors, try to understand what their needs are and to the extent possible to answer those needs um, rather than simply providing subsidies or handouts. And those needs might be, you know, some adjustments in zoning rules. It might be some, you know, a specific group of skills uh, in which, you know, training institutes might be investing in. Uh, they might be, um, you know, sort of, you know, some uh, business plan assistance or assistance with um, uh, purchases of technology. So these things are, could be very, very different depending on the needs of businesses. So I think what's most needed is the kind of capacity at the local level uh, to, to work with local businesses and develop plans that are necessarily going to evolve because you know, con, you know, con, you know, situation always changes over time. So there needs to be flexibility. There needs to be an iteration 
Um, but um, you know, sort of this is the really the, the much more the modern understanding of industrial policy, which is not simply just you know just throw subsidies at a problem, uh, but work uh, with local stakeholders and with local businesses, local training institutions, local labor market institutions, uh, to be able to simultaneously increase productivity and employment uh, in in those firms that particularly need assistance, as are more likely to be in the small and medium sized enterprises. With the larger firms, engage them in a dialogue uh, to understand what it would take uh, for them to, uh, you know, integrate backwards to create local suppliers. Uh, what kind of skills? What kind of training? What kind of infrastructure investments are needed so that large firms uh, can um, can develop deeper roots in the local community and become less footloose, uh, not by penalizing them, but by simply you know, imp increasing the ways in which they can be productive while uh, you know, deepening roots in, in the local community. So that it's a much more kind of much more entrepreneurial type of, of public administration and local development policy. Um, and I think sort of we have examples of how this type of interacting with the private sector works from you know, everything from the you know, regulation of water quality, um, to, um, you know, sort of science and technology policy. Um, and I think where we have not done nearly enough of it uh, is in this area of, 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 of regional development and, 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 and jobs policies. Thank you so much, Danny. We have an, another question uh, about technological change and digital transformation in particular. In particular, uh, that says that technology is playing a democratization role uh, in universalizing the access to information and culture beyond economic elites uh, and spreading it to a considerable portion of the world's population. Uh, however, um, this member of the audience argues that we are controlled by a few multinationals that are hoarding and trading with the new data economy and achieving a degree of dominance that may override national sovereignties. In your opinion, which role should technology play in a good globalization? And second, how should states, nation states regulate it? Um, yeah, it's a huge, uh, huge um, area where um, we need a lot, lot more thinking. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the 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 idea that um, uh, new communication technologies and social media and so forth would um, potentially democratize information, and um, you know, has been, let me say, let's you know, it, you know, has has hit a hard patch recently, and I think we we have a better understanding of both that that is not happening and also a better understanding of why that is so. Um, I think, you know, the kinds of peculiarities of networks and network structures in social media and uh, their ability to be manipulated uh, by both state and non-state actors means that in most circumstances, in fact, we're not going to get better information or more access to information, but we're likely to get, you know, uh, more skewed information or, or more polarization um, and more information bubbles uh, rather than uh, simply, you know, kind of a universalizing or democratizing kind of an effect. So there are fundamental problems uh, in, in the way that, that knowledge and information diffusion is organized currently uh, that, uh, you know, sort of uh, makes us, should make us uh, suspicious uh, that you know, simply the, the dissemination of these technologies uh, is 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 an, uh, is, is, is is you know decidedly uh, uh, benign. So I think we will need um, regulation. I think um, that's uh, for sure. I think uh, in the area of, of um, you know big you know digital platforms and social media. I think you know sort of there are lots of ideas from you know breaking up these monopolies uh, to um, uh, ensuring that there's much greater, you know, sort of, um, you know, interoperability that is, or that, that also that, you know, people can take their, da their data with them to other networks. So I think we need to find ways of creating more competition uh, because at, at present the network effects are so strong that once you're Facebook, once you're Twitter, 
once you're Instagram, it becomes very, very difficult for newcomers to come in. And I think necessarily one element of that uh, is going to be the fracturing, the global fracturing uh, of um, the, um, uh, the internet. Uh, I, I see this is almost inevitable uh, because I think the kinds of regulatory structures um, that Europeans uh, will decide will be very different from what the Americans will want and are obviously already very different from what the Chinese are doing. So I think we need to, um, uh, you know, we need to um, resign ourselves to the fact that, um, that, that we will have a certain fragmentation of the regulatory structures that underpin uh, these uh, digital technologies that, that, that national or regional regula regulations will differ. And therefore that will mean that, you know, that there won't be just one global cloud, that there will be different clouds, it will be different, you know, so there will be some barriers uh, to trade in the digital um, sphere as well. And this in some ways is, is no different than, you know, all the other domains of globalization too, because it's always a trade-off between maximizing free exchange, the gains from trade, versus the cost of um, homogenizing regulations. Because the only way you can maximize the gains from trade is by having one single set of regulations, harmonizing these regulations. But what do you do when different countries have different needs or preferences? They want different regulations. Europeans want more privacy. Um, than, than Americans. Um, and then what you're going to have necessarily is that you have to have, you can't have both maximally, and therefore you have to uh, give up a little bit on, 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 the, on the free, um, on, the, on the gains from trade. I think in the digital sphere, it's going to be, we're going, I feel the same way, uh, that this sort of, you know, this idea of a global internet with a single set of standards, I think is going to be, uh, in my view, untenable. Thanks so much, Danny. Uh, another member of the audience uh, echoes uh, those voices who argue that uh, your call for more governance of globalization necessarily entails increased interventionism. Uh, the question is, is it possible to maintain a liberal vision, liberal stand on the economy, and at the same time, a social strategy based on solidarity as regard to the distribution of resources? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great question. I think it's a great question for the future. I mean, I think for many decades after the end of the Second World War, uh, we had such a vision um, and, and, and different nations constructed somewhat different versions of that, a kind of, you know, from a Scandinavian uh, social model to a sort of central, you know, one in Central Europe that's built around social partners and a system of corporatism, you know, New Deal liberalism in the United States, but they were all built around a vision uh, of a kind of a, of a welfare state, which on the one hand you had, you know, markets that were relatively free, subject to rules and subject to people paying their taxes and subject to regulation. Um, um, but that uh, that but there were also safety nets. There was social insurance. Um, there was investment in public infrastructure, in public goods, in, in education and health, and there was a robust um, set of mechanisms for uh, you know progressive taxation, uh, um, social insurance, unemployment insurance, uh, assistance to families, to children, and so forth. Now, the elements of that welfare state. Um, uh, arrangements, which combined elements of a liberal market uh, with social solidarity. I think those elements uh, began to uh, come apart um, after in, in recent decades. Um, and I think the, 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 the two trends that are really are, are, are putting stresses on that is, is one that we have this process of technological change, uh, which seems to uh, put significant pressures on the ability of labor markets to generate good jobs, because the trend of technological change is skill biased. It rewards the highest skilled, the most professional. It rewards capital. Uh, it rewards large firms. Uh, so technology is, is you know, in some sense, driving labor markets apart, is polarizing them is making it difficult to create the kinds of you know, middle-class jobs under you know, the traditional 
uh, industrial societies or post-industrial societies. And the second thing is that we have a much more globalized economy, which means that you have a number of you know, super exporters like China or some other East Asian exporters, uh, which have been essentially um, uh, uh, um, reinforcing the trends of deindustrialization and, and, and uh, loss of good jobs uh, in, in many regions of the advanced countries. So you put technological change, these trends in technological change um, and, um, and, and, and globalization together, and the welfare state becomes uh, inadequate uh, because the welfare state presumes that if you invest in education, if you train people for labor markets, uh, then people will find good jobs. And then you only have to ensure that they're taken care of because of you know, shocks or idiosyncratic risks, which you can take care of through social insurance. But if the disappearance of these good jobs is a secular consequence uh, of trends in technology and globalization, then simply preparing people for labor markets or taking care of the you know, idiosyncratic shocks to which they should can be subjected is not enough because there's not enough good jobs. There's not enough of a supply of good jobs uh, to begin with. So I think that's the part of the welfare state uh, that's now needs to be fixed. And, and, and that's why you might call sort of in, in a recent article, I've called it sort of um, with my co-author, um, Stephanie uh, Stancheva, we've called it a good jobs welfare state economy, which is that you basically reinforce the important elements of, of the welfare state, but you need to add, add this additional layer of government work of the type that's similar to what I was describing in the context of regional policies, regional employment policies, uh, where um, the public sector is also engaged uh, with producers in getting them to produce more um, uh, sort of more of these um, uh, 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 jobs, uh, middle class jobs, and that's going to require a sort of a you know a different types of of, of strategy uh, than uh, what um, was characterizing the welfare state. And I think you know this is the only way out that I can see, and and it's going to require a lot of experimentation, a lot of uh, new practices, um, and but I think that's the direction in which we need to go. If, as the questioner suggests, we want to maintain you know, thriving economies at the same time as, as, as social solidarity and, and inclusive societies. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stani. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to sh shift. We have more questions in the email, but I'm going to shift to the YouTube uh, chat now and try to, to take a couple of more questions. Uh, one is related to, to what you just mentioned, and basically a member of the audience is asking you for insights about the future of work as we emerge from the pandemic. There has been a manifest on democratizing work um, that has been signed by, for example, Julie Batilana also at the Kennedy School. Uh, could you give any insights about the near future of, of work as we emerge from COVID-19? Uh, yes, I mean, I think COVID-19 is, is, um, is very much as, as, as Mauro would say, uh, is accelerating uh, ongoing uh, uh, trends in the labor market. And certainly one of that is what I was just talking about before, uh, is, is, the, is the divide that has opened up uh, between um, the skill requirements of these new technologies uh, and the skills that our workers already have. Now, I think one thing that you know, we need to understand is that this divide between the skills of the existing workforce and the skill needs of employers can be closed in one of two ways. One is by more, more training and education, but the other is also by redirecting technological change in a way that's more consonant with the skills that the workforce already has, because otherwise, we will always lose the race against technology. So if, the, if our only answer uh, to technology is more investment, education, and training, we will always be behind. I think we need to understand that the direction of technological change is malleable. It responds to economic signals. And it's also of tremendous social significance that cannot be simply left to innovators or to Silicon Valley or to venture capital, um, because 
uh, you know, the, these innovators aren't necessarily thinking about the social consequences of the type of technologies uh, that they generate. And we have a huge amount of margins of choice here, whether we're simply investing in new technologies that are going to replace workers, or we investing in technologies that are going to augment what workers can do. And those are sort of, you know, there, there are different technologies that do one or the other. And I think for you know, normative reasons for reasons having to do with our tax systems, for reasons having to do as to which direction in which our public policies push, we're more likely to get one versus the other. So I think when, you know, when the US government invested in automated vehicles um, and uh, which can, you know, potentially um, uh, displace, uh, you know, tens of thousands of, work of, 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 of uh, drivers, it wasn't thinking about what the labor market consequences of automated vehicles were. It was thinking about, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great to have, you know, uh, you know, military vehicles in the battleground uh, without any people in them, so that we don't have to suffer any battleground casualties. Um, so it was a very specific military motive to that kind of technology. Um, and uh, and but the, the point is that that it, you know. You know, we can have other motives for that drives technology too. In fact, you know, we can invest in AI um, uh, uh, um, uh, technologies that very much uh, augment what lower or middle skilled individuals can do um, on the in the workplace, whether it's the factory or it's in in the, in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a service activity, rather than simply replace them. But we need to to understand that that we need that investment and we need to invest in that uh, redirection uh, of technological change. Uh, so we need a kind of a, a change in our mindsets. Um, so I think that has to come on top of the kinds of things that um, you know, this movement to democratize the workplace has very rightly been talking about in terms of much greater worker voice uh, in, the, uh, in, in the firm. And in fact, these two things are complementary because if you get workers uh, to have greater voice in the workplace uh, than the types of technology development and technology adoption that you're going to get in the workplace is also much more likely to reflect the preferences of not just the owners and the professionals and the managers, but also the, the work, workforce at large. Um, so I think those two things can nicely complement each other. Thank you, Danny. We have a couple of minutes for a very direct, probably complicated question. Uh, how can we bring back to the focus, to the center of the political economy debate, the values of democracy? Well, you know, I think that's a fundamental question. And I think I would say it's not just democracy. Uh, I think it's just liberal democracy, because I think, you know, um, uh, you know, if you think about democracy as uh, you know majority vote, uh, I think that's not enough. We need majority vote uh, combined uh, with a system of rights uh, that protects uh, the um, minority um, and the vulnerable and the um, uh, um, and, and groups that not be part of that that majority. So I think that's the 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 the, the wonderful contribution. Um, of um, Europe in particular in the four or so decades after the Second World War was, pre, you know, was the construction of uh, liberal democracies where um, you know, that, that it was a, a system of rights as well as a system of, of uh, majority rule. And, and what we're losing first and foremost is the liberal side of this. Uh, people are still voting, uh, but you know, it's not clear that the people we're voting for have the same degree of normative attachment uh, to political liberalism uh, as uh, they used to. And I think that's a consequence of this pol political polarization. Um, so I think that's the, that's the major, um, uh, major um, challenge that we face. Uh, I, just, I just hope that this, you know, this, is, this is not a question that economists have to answer because it's really a question that all of us uh, have to grapple. And I think, um, you know, I'm very mindful of a coming presidential election in the United States. So I think the answer is that we should all go out and vote uh, for those who value, who, who, who do um, carry the values of, uh, of, of liberal democracy and vote out of office those who don't. 
Thank you, Danny. This has been such an enlightening conversation, uh, but we have uh, completely run out of time. Thank you, uh, Professor Roderick, for your amazing effort to tackle most of the numerous questions that we got from the, from the audience within the time allotted. Uh, we would like uh, to warmly uh, thank you for addressing issues of uh, current interest in a way that is really accessible for broader audiences and at the same time uh, integrating insights from your scholarship. This is precisely the mission of the Awards Week uh, Cultural Program. Thanks so much to Professor Guillén for guiding this lively exchange so effectively. Uh, gracias, Mauro, and I appreciate your time and insights. And thanks also to the wonderful audience who has followed this event via streaming and posed such interesting questions. Sorry, we couldn't just cope with all of them uh, due to time limits. Uh, and finally, thanks to the team of the Princess of Asturias Foundation for perfectly organizing this virtual event. The recording is now available at the Foundation's website, ready to be downloaded and shared with your contacts. Buenas noches a todos. Good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you, Danny.